Good morning, everybody. Um, we're just going to give it a minute or so to let everybody uh, connect and join us. So don't worry, your speakers are working. We are here. Um, we're just going to give it a sec um, and let everyone join us and then we'll kick it off. Okay, uh, we've got a bunch of people uh, here. I think a few more are just connecting and joining. Uh, so another 30 seconds or so. Uh, and we shall be good to go. Um, just while we're waiting for a few people um, to join, uh, just in case um, it's helpful for people, we do have um, transcripts and captions on. So if it's easier for you to follow the transcripts and the captions, then please, uh, please use those. Um, in a second, I'm going to introduce Connor from the fundraising regulator. Um, and we'll kickstart this session it is also being recorded so you'll be able to watch this back um, and you will be able to uh, share with colleagues uh, and so on afterwards so you don't have to write down everything Connor says and all of the um, all of the questions and answers and everything okay um, I'm going to kick it off um, so good morning everybody uh, welcome to this session with the fundraising regulator um, uh, personified today by Connor Gibson. Um, my name's um, Daniel Flusky. I'm Director of Policy and Comms at the Charter Institute Fundraising and really pleased to be able to host this webinar uh, and have the fundraising regulator here to be able to talk through the changes, the proposals and the questions that are part of this new consultation on the code of fundraising practice. Um, so what we're going to do today, in a second, I'll, uh, Connor will introduce himself uh, and say hello, um, and uh, then go into a presentation, uh, which is going to be around about half an hour or so around the, around the proposals. And then we'll have lots of time for questions uh, and comments and discussion from you uh, as well. A um, couple of uh, housekeeping things. Um, so we have a Q&A function. Um, as we're going through, or as Connor's going through, if you've got specific questions that you'd like uh, Connor to answer or for us to discuss, it would be great if you could put those in the Q&A function rather than the chat, um, just so that we can keep all of the questions that are specific to the subject in there and we'll get to them as best we can afterwards. If you've got general kind of comments or want to share thoughts, then put them in the chat and everybody, as you've been doing around the sound and everything, and I hope, uh, I'm glad that's working for you now, Marianne, um, then do put them in the chat. But yeah, direct questions that you'd like to be addressed as part of the webinar, please do put them in the Q&A. Um, once Connor has just said hello, we're going to kick start actually by um, putting a couple of questions up about your level of awareness and thoughts about the current code. Um, which will be great just to kind of uh, preface the session and get a sense of your thoughts on what you use and know with the code currently. Um, and there'll also be uh, a few questions at the end uh, just to get a sense of your thoughts and ideas about the changes and the proposals that are being put forward. All of the polls are anonymous. Um, it's just to get a sense of who's in the room and where your, where your thoughts are. Um, OK, I think that's probably enough from me. Um, for now, uh, we should get into what we are here to talk about. Uh, so Connor, I will hand over to you and it'd be great if you could um, introduce yourself to people and um, just talk a little bit about what you're going to be talking about today. Thanks, Dan. Um, and thanks everybody for coming along today. Uh, so I'm the policy manager at the Fundraising Regulator. Uh, I've been in this post since around February. And in that time, I've been primarily working on developing proposals for the review of the Code of Fundraising Practice. Uh, so what we're going to cover here today. Uh, so as I go over what we're going to cover, and then you see what we do cover, if any of you want to fill in 
those poll questions that Dan sent, that'll give us a good understanding of uh, what your current perceptions of the code are and, and how they align with what people have been telling us. But today, basically, we're going to talk a little bit about the code itself. Um, I appreciate that there's a wide range of people here today, and not everybody will be as familiar with the codes as some are. Uh, but we're not going to go into the fine detail of how the funders regulator works and uh, things like that, because that information is fairly easily available on our website. And the focus here is really on the code review itself. So I'll then explain why we're reviewing the code, what the process is, the timeframes involved, uh, what people have already told us, and then how that's informed what we're going to consult on and the ways that you can uh, let us know what you think about our proposals, because that's essentially the entire purpose of this consultation is to find out what people think of what we have in mind and then use your perspectives to inform what we do going forward into the next steps. Um, and then at the end, there will be plenty of time for questions from uh, the attendees as well. We're also probably going to ask you a few more poll questions about what you think about the proposals, just so that we can get a picture of that. Uh, so that'll come up towards the end. Uh, but just to get us into the swing of things, explain what the code itself does. It um, sets standards for that apply to all aspects of charitable fundraising for registered charities, exempt charities, third parties, and also uh, for fundraising platforms. Uh, it's a voluntary system of uh, self-regulation, which is why it's so important to us that we get the uh, perspectives and consent from uh, fundraisers like yourselves for the changes that we want to make to the code um, and it uses we use it as a framework for assessing complaints that we receive from the public so there's also an important role that the code plays in outlining to uh, the general public potential donors what is expected uh, from fundraising and how fundraisers should behave and what they can do if they consider that a fundraiser has not behaved appropriately or is not uh, stuck to the rules that we've set out uh, and the overarching principles behind the code are that fundraising activities should be legal, open, honest, and respectful. Um, so the code review process uh, started last year uh, in the autumn. It's the first full review that we've conducted since October 2019. Um, I'm sure you're aware a lot has happened since October 2019. Um, across many, many aspects uh, of, of society that could have an impact on uh, what happens in terms of fundraising behavior and also how people respond to certain things. So there's been uh, technological developments and increase in the use of uh, micro payments and tap to donate functionality, uh, also the emergence and popularization of digital currency and the impact that could have on uh, how people conduct fundraising and how people receive funds. Uh, there's been changes in legislation in that time. There've been developments in data protection laws. Uh, particularly, there's been the introduction of the new Charities Act and some of the requirements in there about reporting and providing information about where funds come from and uh, how they're spent. And uh, the long tail of Brexit, which could lead to a number of new laws being brought in to uh, take the place of existing EU laws or, or developments in certain areas that could have an impact on fundraising. And so, yeah, a lot has been going on there. Uh, aspects that are covered in the current code that may need to be updated or amended or uh, possibly removed entirely from an updated code. Um, there's also been some changes in fundraising behavior. Obviously, when people were locked down for months on end, there was a lot less face-to-face -face fundraising going on. There were more remote events, uh, increased use of, of social media for campaigns and even people uh, starting to look at using uh, streaming and gaming services as well as ways to raise uh, money. Um, however, as, uh, as we've seen in the last year, as things have opened up more, there's been an upsurge in face-to-face -face fundraising activity. Um, and with that, whether that's people who are new to face-to-face -face fundraising, uh, having to familiarize themselves with the rules or just that uh, it's uh, there's been a gap in between and people are having to um, 
think about different ways that they can provide information and, and interact with people whenever they're doing face-to-face -face fundraising. Um, and just tied into the lockdown issue as well as the wider societal changes. People during uh, the COVID period were a lot more, a lot. Of, some people were available for more uh, voluntary activity and keen to get involved in that sort of stuff. But there's been the impact of the cost of living crisis uh, on uh, how, how and how much the public are willing to uh, to donate voluntarily. There's been a, um, a move towards lotteries and prize draws by some organizations as well uh, under the premise that donors like to get something back for what they're giving. Um, and even just the simple uh, effect of more people working from home, which means that, uh, you know, potentially if you're going to go and knock on someone's door and talk to them about fundraising at two o'clock in the afternoon, that could be a lot more disruptive for someone who is working from home than knocking on their door at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, things that have gone on since 2019, as I'm sure you have all noticed. Um, so you see here, this is an outline of what our proposed timeline is for the code review. As I mentioned, back in November of last year, we uh, launched a call for information to get suggestions from people about what aspects of the, the code could be expanded or amended or adjusted uh, in certain ways. Um, if there's new areas that we need to uh, provide rules or guidance on, um, we then took that information and alongside information that we got from uh, other stakeholder engagement and, and uh, from our day-to-day -day work at the regulator, and we put that into a set of proposals which are in the public consultation, which launched just last Wednesday. Uh, we had an event in Scotland, uh, also hosted by the CIOF, where we launched that. Um, it's a 12-week period, uh, so it's until the 1st of December, um, and it's open for uh, any, any submissions about a wide range of aspects that I'm going to cover in more detail later. Uh, Following on from that, we'll analyze the responses, we'll produce a draft of the new code, which could be significantly different uh, from the existing code, have a further period of engagement, and then aim to launch the new code in early 2025. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the detail of the later stages now, because I cover that uh, further on in the presentation, but just so you know, that's generally the time frame that we're on, it's gonna be about a two and a half year uh, process in total. Um, so, so far from the call for information, we've had a few things pulled out uh, about aspects of the code that we could do more work with. Um, generally, on the topic of clarity and accessibility, people were fairly happy with what they uh, see in the code as it is. Maybe your poll responses will say something different whenever we look at those later, but who knows. Um, but there's definitely room for improvement. Uh, in how the information is presented. Um, the glossary in particular was an aspect that people mentioned uh, not being as clear as it could be or, or requiring expansion. And so that's uh, something that we've been focusing on quite a bit. Um, I've already alluded to it a couple of times, but the digital fundraising landscape, whether that's through platforms, whether that's working with influencers, whether that's doing uh, online events, uh, a lot has changed that needs to be uh, addressed under a revised code. Maybe that would be addressed, be addressed by new rules about specific approaches, or maybe it could be addressed by clarifying where the existing rules fit within those uh, approaches. Um, the third point there about working with volunteers and external partners, uh, the relationships and the terms of agreements with uh, professional fundraisers, commercial participators, uh, and volunteer fundraisers uh, is a very uh, important issue for uh, a huge swathe of uh, organizations that are conducting fundraising. We're keen to make sure the information about what needs to be in written agreements and who's responsible for what is as clear as possible and can be uh, easily accessed. So it's uh, something that 
bodies of all sizes who are conducting fundraising can understand what their responsibilities are. So it's not a uh, um, overly detailed uh, presentation of information, but does have all the clear uh, details that people need. Um, sort of connected to that, uh, but uh, also a completely separate point is the rules where the fundraising regulator is not the lead regulator. Um, this is a an issue that come, has come up a few times where the code currently contains rules on things like uh, gifted, advertising, gambling, where uh, data protection, where there is a uh, clear lead regulator that sets sometimes sets legal requirements uh, that must be upheld. And whilst it's useful for the fundraising regulator to uh, identify the existence of those rules, we want to be clear that we're not responsible for enforcing those rules. Um, we think we need to get a balance between providing information and direction on uh, how to avoid falling for file of those piece of legislation and not giving the impression that that's an area that we uh, can act on ourselves. Um, and then finally, in the broader uh, context of what the code does and uh, how fundraising activity takes place, there's the issue of uh, vulnerability, whether that's uh, seeking donations from people who, find that, who are in vulnerable circumstances uh, and being clear on uh, what the responsibilities are of charities whenever they have reason to believe that uh, somebody may have, uh, may be facing vulnerable circumstances that might affect their decision making. Um, and also suggestions that there could be a more holistic role for the code in potentially offering uh, protections to fundraisers in their interactions with donors um, and uh, providing them some protections from uh, you know, potential abuse or, or harassment in that respect. Um, so as I mentioned, the uh, consultation is 12 weeks long and the uh, key themes, which I'm going to go through now in detail, uh, are developing principles-based rules, reviewing the rules where we're not the lead regulator, um, expanding and amending some of our existing rules, and then more generally improving the accessibility and clarity of uh, the code. Um, so on the first point, which I think is one of the most significant ones that we're uh, covering in the consultation and in our proposals, um, the idea of developing principles-based rules is that uh, we would have a less uh, prescriptive code that would say you must do A, B, C and D and you must not do X, Y and Z, uh, but that we would focus on uh, the principle behind the intent of those uh, requirements, which could then make the, uh, which could streamline how the rules are presented and make it for a, a easier to read code, but also allow for uh, some degree of future proofing. And you could think about how this principle would apply in a range of different contexts, rather than saying you must do this with um, with direct mail and you must do this with face-to-face -face and you must do this with uh, online uh, fundraising campaigns. Uh, if there is a principle about providing clear information about fees, uh, then that principle could apply to uh, a direct mail or a print ad or an online ad, just that the information is clear, not that it has to be a certain size, not that it has to be appear in a specific place, but that the principle is applied that it will be clear information so that people can understand what fees are involved. Um, and as I say, this is allowing us to then apply those rules in a range of different contexts, rather than having a rule for each uh, media, we have a, a general principle based rule that can apply in a range of media that we already know exist and ones that may emerge in the future. Um, we will still include examples of uh, indicative examples of prohibitive practices or specific requirements when you have to say uh, what the terms are for uh, a prize draw or uh, 
terminology that you cannot use whenever you're approaching someone in the street that that will still remain and all the existing protections within the code will remain but they will be captured by uh, principles which can then be uh, more easily applied in the wider sense um, probably the best way to demonstrate this is with an example fortunately the consultation has examples of principle based rules for every single section of the code that you'll be able to look at. So if you're not so clear on what a principles based rule for grants and foundations would look like, you can go to the consulta online consultation and you can look at that uh, principles based rule. The example we've got here for you today, which may not be completely clear, I'm trying to get it on one slide here, but I will uh, talk you through it. Uh, this is looking at uh, a number of rules, four rules that appear in different parts of the code that are relating to uh, a general principle of behavior towards people when asking for money, when conducting fundraising, but being respectful and polite. Um, the proposed principles based rule uh, would read that you must behave professionally at all times. This includes not placing undue pressure on a person to donate or ignoring a request to end a conversation. Um, so that has captured the requirements that are within those four rules on the left hand side, whilst also giving us a uh, wider scope than uh, saying these are the only things that you must do and these are the only things that you must not do. Um, this is also an interesting rule in that it addresses another topic that we uh, cover in the consultation, which is protection of fundraisers. There, some people said there was some of the respondents to the call for information had concerns that the requirement that fundraisers should be polite at all times could potentially um, put them in a position where they can't respond appropriately to inappropriate behavior or harassment you know, by ending a conversation or by, um, by addressing somebody's inappropriate behavior. And so by reframing it as a principle to behave professionally at all times. It can be perfectly professional to, to respond to harassment by uh, asking someone to stop or by ending a conversation. Um, we're setting out a principle that can apply in a wide range of contexts and which can also uh, offer uh, some additional protection to the fundraisers themselves. The, the four rules that I've listed here um, are covered under this indicative change, but also it could fit into uh, other contexts and other sections of the code as well, whether that's talking to people about legacies or door-to-door uh, -door fundraising. So by having uh, headline principles that apply in a range of contexts, we can actually, we may find that we can actually remove some other rules that duplicate the, uh, the principles that are held within, there, within those. Um, the other big change that could uh, potentially streamline, shorten the code quite a lot is reviewing how we present information about rules that are covered by other regulators. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a huge range of these, uh, big ones being things like data protection, data protection and advertising, um, and even, even gifted. Uh, we think it is useful that people have information on this, but we're not entirely sure that by trying to reproduce the detail of GDPR regulation into rules in our code is the best way to provide people with that information. Um, there's some sections have a lot of detail about uh, legal requirements and things covered by other regulators and so other sections do not. We're trying to be consistent in what people can expect from the code. And so, if instead we highlight the existence and the relevance of these uh, pieces of legislation and direct readers to the primary source where they can find the most reliable and most up-to-date information, that could be a much more uh, effective utilization of the space within the code to say the ICO is responsible, the information commissioner's office is responsible for uh, data protection, legislation, you can find guidance through these links. You can find information about the legislation here. Um, there's 
the, the big risk as well is that, as I mentioned before, a lot of legislation has changed since the last code review. It will be more than six years from the last uh, code uh, rewrite being published in 2019 until we publish the new one. So, um, well, nearly six years. Uh, and a lot of legislation has changed in that time. And there's a risk that we have a rule that reflects a law that has since changed, but we haven't been able to go through the full consultation process to update our own code. Um, not every, in not a, there are some scenarios where we will retain some aspects of uh, rules that are linked to uh, legislation, but we do think it's a lot more useful to uh, direct people to where they can find the most up-to-date and relevant information from the body that is in charge of that. Um, on a related note, uh, there's also the aspect that the code is uh, referred to by people who wish to complain about fundraising. And if they see that we have a rule about uh, data protection or a rule about uh, um, gambling legislation, that we would be able to enforce that, that they would bring their complaint to us. Uh, and so it could be setting an unrealistic expectation that the fundraising regulator can actually uh, investigate and enforce under these rules whenever, in fact, we don't have the power to do that. That's covered by uh, government bodies, statutory bodies and the like. Um, as with uh, the principles-based rules, there are examples on the online form that you can see of what this would look like, what this revised presentation would look like. There's significantly fewer because generally the approach is we will take a lot of rules and turn it into a summary of uh, what the legislation says. So one of the examples is uh, this one, which I have for you here, um, which covers gifted. Uh, there, the first two columns are the existing rules in the code, which cover gifted, sorry, this is a little crowded. The, the intention isn't that you would read this in detail, it's more to give you the, a picture of the, uh, the scale of what we're doing. And you can read it in detail by looking at the online form uh, at your leisure. But essentially what we're doing is we're taking, um, we're taking four rules that apply in, that currently appear in two different sections of the code that take up close to 300 words on the page. And we're condensing that into a summary of the expectations around gift aid that's about 120 words long and contains direct links to where you can find more information, uh, which is something that is not always as consistent as it could be in the current code. Um, so the indicative change there basically outlines uh, how gift aid works, that it allows charities to reclaim tax on donations made by UK taxpayers. Um, and that uh, HM Revenue and Customs is the lead statutory body for all matters relating to tax, including gift aid, um, and then explaining that if you want to take advantage of gift aid, you have to only claim it uh, under the appropriate schemes, gift aid small donation scheme, and that, you, uh, that organizations are expected to keep up to date with the guidance from HMRC. So rather than saying that the code of fundraising practice is where you will find every last piece of information you need to know about gift aid. Instead, we're saying uh, revenue and customs will provide all the most relevant and up-to-date information on gift aid and it's your responsibility to uh, keep an eye on that so that you can uh, make sure that your gift aid implementation is completely compliant with, uh, with all the laws involved. Um, more generally, we are looking at expanding or potentially amending existing rules within the code. Um, we may decide that we want to add new rules to cover new approaches. If uh, one issue that's come up a few times has been the nature of relationships with uh, social media influencers and um, how they can be categorized, whether that's what counts as in aid of and on behalf of uh, fundraising or what would require written agreements and what should those written agreements involve. Um, we've got lists of proposals for amendments to some of the rules that people highlighted in the call for information. So you may have already told us 
that you think there's a problem with a certain rule and then you will find it in the proposal in the proposals for the consultation where we've said we agree um for example there's there's uh two rules that run after each other which are about uh, uh working with third parties um the first rule says that you must make all efforts to ensure that your third parties do this this and this and the second rule says you must ensure that your third party does this this and this and so simply for consistency's sake, we think it's reasonable that both rules would say you must make all efforts to ensure uh, because the must ensure is setting too high a bar. Um, there's room, there'll be room for you to comment on those changes and also to suggest any other ones that you might have in mind that haven't come up through the call for information or the further engagement that we've done. Um, we are having a general review of standards uh, on people in vulnerable circumstances and potentially adding the additional protections for fundraisers. That would only be relating to uh, fundraisers interactions with donors. Uh, this is one of the, the aspects where the, the, the legal uh, thing comes in as well. It would seem to be a reasonable use of our uh, powers as the fundraising regulator to set expectations for how fundraisers interact with donors and potential donors. But when it comes to uh, inside an organization, if there's, a, um, if there's a problem with the relationship between a fundraising manager and a, and a fundraising officer within an organization, that's an employment legislation issue and it's not an area that we can get involved in. But we think it would be potentially a very uh, beneficial use of the code if we set the requirement that uh, in order to abide by our rules, charities have to have appropriate protections in place for um, people who are fundraising for them uh, whenever they're interacting with the public. Uh, and because we have you filling in the form anyway, there's a few other aspects that uh, we ask about uh, sort of open questions on wider topics that we think may uh, become more relevant uh, but we're not, we don't have a clear proposal on how we want to address them yet. Uh, one is the use of artificial intelligence in fundraising. Um, it's a much talked about topic, but uh, it's not one that we've seen that much research into uh, the implementation or the implications. There's uh, a mechanism on every page of the code review for you to add supporting documentation or, or evidence to support your uh, response and we're very keen to hear about any organizations who have actually already implemented uh, AI or machine learning mechanisms in fundraising and they can maybe uh, attach some of their internal documentation that they might not want to share more widely but uh, could inform our evidence-based decision making. Um, similarly, uh, we're keen to know what uh, fundraisers have to say about the requirements in the code regarding times of day whenever certain fundraising activity can take place, such as well, one of the biggest ones is door-to-door -door fundraising and they, they cut off points of when you should be knocking on people's door. And also uh, age limits for involvement in certain fundraising activities. We know that there are charities that to align with their own values or just as a general safety measure might have their own cutoff uh, point for uh, involvement in volunteer fundraising, which is higher than a legal requirement. And it would be interested to hear uh, how they reach those decisions and why they, uh, they chose to do that. Similarly, we uh, would be interested to hear from charities who may have conducted research into uh, the effectiveness of um, certain door-to-door uh, -door fundraising at certain times of day and you know, when when they are most likely to get signups, because that can inform uh, some of the decisions we make on potential uh, adjustments to those. We're not proposing any adjustments, we're just interested to find out more. Uh, one of the big reasons for that is that also this autumn, we are conducting some uh, public research with a, a polling agency into general perceptions of fundraising. And we expect that um, many of the public respondents will have things to say about their 
preferences for time of day for fundraising activity. And we're interested to know uh, what, we're interested to hear both sides. We're expecting to hear quite a bit from the public on that, although the research hasn't been conducted yet. So this is an opportunity for you to uh, provide some evidence and, and uh, some explanation of uh, whether you think the current system is suitable or whether you think there should be some changes in, in any direction. Um, the last of our key themes is about improving the accessibility and clarity of the code. Um, we've already done some work in this in the last year or so uh, by providing more uh, guidance on our website on things like uh, volunteer fundraising, on how to differentiate between what's an in aid of volunteer and what's an on behalf of volunteer. But we think we could do even more of that uh, by particularly if we have a principles-based rule approach, and then we may have some guidance that gives you examples, that gives you um, possibly even, even templates for, for some of the forms that you might need to use or um, lists of uh, scenarios where certain approaches would be appropriate and certain approaches would not. Um, we're very keen to make the website itself more accessible. There's, we're going to be doing a review of our website in general, and we might look at ways that we can uh, better structure information about uh, things like written agreements with third parties so that you might be able to say, I'm a uh, registered charity working with a commercial participator in Wales, uh, which are the, tick these boxes and they'll show you the requirements of what a written agreement might need to say. Um, rather than trying to provide every last piece of information uh, in the code itself by uh, directing people towards the website where it can be presented in a range of formats, uh, then it could be a much more useful application than simply uh, having everything appear within the letter of the code itself. Um, we may even, one of the things that came up in the meeting that we had uh, just last week to launch the consultation was uh, looking at other ways of presenting the information beyond written rules. The, the code review itself is focusing on what the code will say and what the words in the code will be. And the code needs to contain lots of words explaining things, but we might be able to uh, provide other resources or look at other organizations who have already provided those resources and, and link to those, uh, explaining some of the more complex topics because uh, accessibility from our perspective also means not uh, expecting everybody to have the capacity to read every aspect of the code and understand every part of it inside out. There are a huge range of organizations that are captured by the Code of Fundraising Practice, a huge range of organizations that use our uh, our badge uh, and sign up for that voluntarily. Uh, we want it to be uh, as convenient as possible for somebody who is, you know, a part-time trustee of a small charity who's going to do a event to find out what they need to know to make sure that their event is compliant. Um, and that may mean uh, looking at other formats as well. So the rule book will still, the, the rules in the code will still be lots of words, but there might be other resources that are available to people. Uh, to present that information uh, and just more generally if we go ahead with lots of our proposals then we might find that some sections will be combined into each other or reorganized or represented uh, this is a pretty comprehensive uh, redrafting of the code and so it may be that uh, legacies is no longer section 15 it's part of a different section or that uh, grants fundraising is uh, combined into another part of the code. This is just uh, a general aspect that we are kind of interested to see if anybody's got any smart ideas. We've all, we all know what the code is supposed to say. You might have ideas of how, uh, what is actually there and how it could be saying that better. So there's a lot of room within the consultation for you to um, comment on those aspects, uh, which then 
takes me on to uh, how should you actually respond to the consultation? As I mentioned before, we want to make this as accessible as possible to as many organizations and individuals as possible that's relevant to. And so what we've done is we've gone for a digital first, first approach. We've created an online format that is uh, hopefully very straightforward to navigate. Uh, and you can find the specific parts of the consultation that are relevant to you and respond to as many or as few of those proposals as you want. If you are only interested in volunteer fundraising, you can go straight to section five and you can respond to the proposals on volunteer fundraising and hit submit, and that is your response done. You can save your response and come back to it. When you submit a response, uh, you'll get an email copy of what you responded as well. So you'll still have a full record, uh, which I, I'm sure is a very important thing, particularly for the, the largest organizations, which might have a number of people filling in the forms. Uh, and uh, by having it in this uh, online format, we're also able to provide supplementary information like the examples of principles-based rules. As I said, there is a there is at least one example for every single one of the 15 sections of the code. Uh, and that'll hopefully help your understanding of what we intend through our proposals. Um, we have, it is a long document, but there is not an expectation that you would uh, complete all of it. I'll, Give you a quick run through in the next slide of what's uh, what the breakdown is of the sections of the consultation but in total there are over 200 proposals we are not expecting uh, many if any uh, organizations to respond to every single proposal that we have made um, we want them to focus on those that are most relevant to uh, their work area and the ones where they have something uh, constructive to to offer in that regard. Um, there are several hundred, I can't see the number right now, but there are several hundred people on this webinar. There may be more who uh, see the recording of the webinar. We have in-person events as well that we're conducting, which will probably mean that we end up speaking in the next few weeks to about 500 individuals. If all 500 of those individuals send responses, uh, that's a lot of information for us to process but by encouraging people to put it into the online form, uh, we will be able to structure how we receive that information. And hopefully then that'll uh, make the whole process of consolidating and assessing the information much more straightforward for us. And also it will mean that there's much less risk that uh, there could be a misinterpretation or a misattribution of a comment that you've made if you've said, I think this about this specific proposal, then we know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and that'll hopefully improve a lot of the processes along the way. So this is an outline of what is actually in the consultation itself. Um, we kind of would encourage people to, uh, if you're only going to uh, cover a few parts of the consultation, focus on parts A, B, and C, because those are the points where you can comment more generally on, on the key themes, which I've discussed in detail already, the principles-based rules, the lead regulator um, aspects. Uh, so that's part A. So there's a small number of uh, proposals. You can respond to as many or as few as you'd like. Um, part B uh, is looking at uh, expansions of the code, you know, new technologies, um, some of the uh, aspects of yeah, micro donations and social media. Um, there's also the part in the expanding the code section in part B, which addresses things like artificial intelligence and the uh, time of day for fundraising activity. That's where we've asked those questions. So if that's what you're interested in, that's where you can find that. And part C is where we have the amendments to specific rules. Uh, for example, the, uh, the, the example I gave earlier about uh, you must make all efforts to ensure versus you must ensure. Uh, they're, um, they're fairly straightforward proposals, but we want to make sure that people are in favor of us making these changes or 
can identify any issues that might emerge because of them. And then part D, which is the longest section, uh, has the proposals for every single rule in the current code split into the 15 individual sections that currently appear in the code. Um, so for every rule that is currently in the code, we've made a proposal either to uh, remove or retain or revise that rule. Uh, and you're able to uh, comment on as many or as few of those as are relevant to you, uh, as many or as few of those as you have a perspective on. Um, there really isn't an expectation that uh, that many of the respondents will go into detail on every aspect of even an individual section, let alone every aspect of every section. Um, but just to finish up, uh, before the, oh, it's not quite to finish up actually, sorry, but I'm just showing you here now, this is an example of uh, what the online form looks like. As you see, you can go straight to section 15 if you're interested in legacies, and you can uh, scroll through there, see the proposals, uh, put your comments in uh, or leave them blank if you don't have any comments on the aspect. Uh, in question, each section also has a, do you have any other thoughts uh, kind of question at the end. And there's the mechanism for uh, adding any supporting documentation and then uh, submitting. So hopefully it is uh, straightforward and understandable uh, and we can get a good range of uh, responses to that. Um, I mentioned before that I was going to talk a bit more about the next steps. And so, as you see, we're currently in the consultation page, but we're also doing regional sessions. Uh, we had one in Scotland last week. We have one in Northern Ireland this week, Wales next week, and then a session in England in person uh, in the first week of October. Uh, we're also going to talk to wider stakeholders and, and some of the regulatory bodies about what their thoughts are on the proposals in mind. Uh, then later this year, early 2024, we're going to be actually analysing all the responses that you've got. As I mentioned, there could be a very large volume of responses, so we're quite keen that they come through in a format that allows us to analyse them uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, and we'll use that to inform how we redraft the code um, then in uh, sort of getting towards the summer 2024, obviously some of the timings are dependent here, we're going to seek perspectives on the um, rewritten code. Uh, it's going to be more sort of detail focused. We might we haven't established exactly what the format of that consultation will be, but the intention is that the current consultation, the 12 week consultation that is going on right now is your chance to steer what the new code will say to um, to really have a say in what the direction of the new rules will be. The, the second consultation period will be more sort of detail focused, it'll be shorter, it might be more, uh, um, it might take a slightly different format, but if you want to have a say in what direction the code goes in, now is the time during the 12-week consultation because we've made this as, as flexible and access accessible as we can to allow as many voices to come in, we can uh, then consider that and uh, consolidate those perspectives into a new code. Uh, because of the extra step of the second consultation period, we're now expecting that we won't launch the new code until early 2025. Initially, it was to be late 2024, but we think it would be useful to have the extra time. Uh, not uh, only because we We'll have to get a full legal review of the rewritten code after we've got feedback from it. We'll also have to make sure it's, uh, as the current code is, available in uh, Welsh language version and make sure that it's plain English so that it's uh, clear and understandable to a wide audience. Um, it's also just worth pointing out that uh, when we launch the new code, there is likely to be a, a kind of grace period of around well, probably six months where we are giving charities time to bring their processes into line with the new rules. Uh, we won't be taking uh, launching investigations or taking enforcement action under the new rules until six months after they've launched. Uh, so that'll give you time to make sure that everything's up to speed and up to scratch. And also, they shouldn't be 
major surprises in there because the uh, the draft code that will have been consulted on in mid 2024 will hopefully be very close uh, to what the final uh, code ends up looking like. Um, so that's essentially it from the presentation. Uh, I believe Dan is going to send around a few more quick poll questions just to see what your general perspectives are of some of the ideas and the principles behind the new, uh, behind the consultation uh, and what's in there. Um, and then we will have uh, questions from Q and A. I haven't been able to, to track that. So hopefully there's some in there already and Dan's been doing some vetting, but uh, in the meantime as well, if you want to have a, uh, just quickly respond to the poll questions that he sent round and that might give us something to discuss as well. And otherwise, it'll just be some useful information for us to, to back up uh, decisions we make along the way. Well, thank you so much, Connor. Um, lots of information there. Um, and obviously, a huge amount of work has gone into this uh, in terms of looking at different areas, looking at the, the previous call for evidence and putting questions together and um, examples and so on as well. And I appreciate uh, that we are in a particular point in that wider consultation period and there's a further one going to happen so i know you'll do your best to answer the questions that we're going to put to you um but um just a reminder to people uh that uh you know we're at a particular point and obviously you know connor is one person fundraising regulator may not have all of the answers right hand but i'm sure he will do his best okay um kind of we should let you kind of catch your breath and grab a drink of water or something so we'll just get people's uh Kind of initial views on some of the areas that you have covered so i'm just going to launch the poll questions which should be coming up on everybody's screen um so a few questions just to kind of get your your thoughts really on what you've heard um so first one how do you feel about the code moving towards more of a principles base for rules um rather than uh more of the uh, detailed uh, and specific steps that are in there now. So you can strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, or don't know. Um, so while you are looking at that one, we've got uh, four questions, I think. So I'll just read them all out and then let you uh, respond. Um, do, do you agree or not with replacing rules relating to topics covered by other regulators. Uh, the example you gave Connor was the gift aid one. So uh, do you think it is better for there to be a smaller, more concise overarching role, which then says for all gift aid information, go over there rather than try to replicate that within the code? Um, third question, do you agree or not with the proposal for the code to provide more information out about how funds will be used if a campaign is unsuccessful, which is one of the detailed questions is in there. And one of the specific ones as well, do you agree or not with a rule requiring charitable organisations to go into the code, uh, a rule requiring charitable organisations to cooperate with the fundraising regulator? So there are some uh, questions there in the, uh, in the poll. Uh, so there should be four questions. Don't worry about poll one. Um, there's just poll two there with four questions. Um, while you're responding to that, we're just going to have a look at the some of the questions that you've been putting uh, in the Q&A function and also uh, just having a quick scan of the chat as well. Uh, so uh, I will just end the poll in a sec. We'll see what you have said and then uh, we will come to question time with Connor. Um, Okay, so uh, Connor, um, and for everybody, so uh, there seems to be strong agreement um, with the code moving towards a principles-based approach. So, oh God, my maths is gonna get tested now. 79% of people either strongly agreeing or agreeing with that approach. Um, that uh, similar level of support, uh, about 80% uh, agreeing 
or strongly agreeing with the move towards pointing more people towards other lead regulators rather than that being in the code. Um, and slightly less agreement um, around the uh, agree or not with the proposal for the code to provide more information about how funds will be used if the campaign is unsuccessful. And about 77% of people agreeing that a rule should go in there requiring charitable organisations to cooperate with the fundraising regulator. So it looks like people are happy with the direction. Um, appreciate that some people might have only seen this for the first time today, so we'll need a bit more time to work through the detail. But it looks like there's some um, agreement there with the direction of travel, and I imagine um, we'll be looking at it in more detail um, as they do their responses. Um, okay, so on to questions. Um, and I'm going to see if I can try to group some of these. Uh, and I know some people will put more questions in as we're going, um, but it might jump around between between topics, kind of just to keep you on your toes. Um, so just on um, people responding, actually, just because um, there's a couple of ones about people responding. So um, you have talked about the online first, digital first. Um, there's a question around whether there'll be kind of downloadable PDF copies and how people can can um, respond to it. Uh, but when you say it's digital first, is it digital only? Um, uh, no, no, it's it's not digital only at all. Um, we it was partly an accessibility aspect as well. That whenever we've been getting this on our website, we've been working with the web developers that we have to make sure that it is. Uh, consistent with accessibility standards for people who might need some additional functionality to to read and access the information but uh, there's a uh, people are able to contact us directly and uh, let us know if they need any uh, alternative formats and we're happy to provide that uh, we would definitely encourage everyone who can to use the online form uh, but we're happy to provide alternative formats uh, to people, I think it's just it's useful to know uh, what the best alternative format for them is, and then create that rather than just say you can either have it online or you can have it as a PDF, but you can't have any other options. So we're, that's that's the approach that we've gone. But yeah, we're we're very much aware that uh, whilst the online form is one of the more accessible approaches, it's not the it's not the only way that information can be accessible, and there may be other ways that people want to or need to uh, access it. Right, thank you. Um, and there was also a question around um, kind of response volume, I think, um, and how you look at it. Because um, I think uh, you had said, or the question says that in, in the presentation you said about where there are multiple responses from people within a certain charity mm -hmm. and that that was okay. <laughs> um, so I guess and, and that, what they were asking was how do you look at the responses in terms of kind of waiting engaging kind of um responses so because if one organization replies from x charity does that count as one response but if you got 500 mm -hmm. fundraisers to all put in a particular view then you'd have 500 responses over there so i think it was just trying to find out a little bit more about how you review and weigh the responses that come in versus kind of individuals and organizations and so on so, um, you know, in, in the general sense, we don't want to give sort of extra weight to a certain type of organization and say, well, you're, you're one of the special ones you get to, your say has more say. Uh, you know, every, every response from organizations of all sizes will be considered and will be given due consideration of weight. However, uh, often what happens during these sorts of consultations is that we will get, there will be institutional responses from perhaps the Chartered Institute of Fundraising, you know, uh, it, it represents X number of fundraisers. Uh, and that's useful information for us to consider uh, because it may be that they have uh, formulated their response by uh, talking to a wide range of uh, organizations, or it may be that they're a, a specific fundraising body in Wales, or they're a specific body for organizations that want to set up lotteries in Northern Ireland. And so that, that insight can, uh, inform how we assess the response and that can be very useful for us but uh, it is a uh, 
fairly democratic uh, approach <laughs> in that so one person outlining an argument for why something may not be appropriate will be considered. Um, but we, yeah, we do, we are aware that there are some organizations that will be sending through responses uh, that are uh, the perspective of a wider range of people than just one individual. Absolutely, thank you. And, and you know, your work as a regulator is not just count up a number of responses and do that because, you know, 52% mm -hmm. of people say that versus 48% of people say that. Uh, yeah, we're, we're very keen. I mean, the, as I said, every single page of the form has the option as well to provide, yeah. uh, to upload documentation. Uh, we, uh, just for, for sake of people's information, I came to the fundraising regular having previously worked in advertising regulation. And that is an area where there is an outrageous amount of data and research <laughs> and monitoring and uh, often contradictory as well. However, in the world of fundraising, people are spending a lot less money on publishing and uh, putting out research papers and uh, things like that. So if your organization has conducted some research like this that could be considered as an evidential base for a position, then that can be really useful for us if we want to be uh, looking at uh, evidence-based regulation uh, as a as a I, I don't want to say the word principle I've said it so many times <laughs> the guiding on approach yes That's it. okay um thank you um and just to, just to remind people as we're going through if you've got more questions then do put them in pop them in the Q&A function and we will do our best to get them in the time um that we've got um if we don't get to answer all of the questions um uh, on the session today um, on the consultation documentation on the fundraising regulators website there's an email address isn't there to contact yeah. so if you've got any questions um, then you can always drop Connor a line um, so I presume it's not just you Connor but you can drop yes. drop the team no, a no, line. Um, it's a gen generic inbox so I'm not the only yeah. person doing this um, okay um, right let's get to some of the other questions um, on, um, you mentioned Connor about the fact that people are asking, you're asking some questions, or you're asking a lot of questions now, potential questions, but then there's another stage of, I think in your, your timeline, you said feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so presumably, you know, things like that general approach or where, and where you've got examples, where it says we're looking at a big thing about should we change the overall approach to being like this or like this so principles based or take out you know leaked regulator information so presumably the further stage of feedback will be you told us you wanted to take this approach this is we we've taken that on board and this is therefore what the proposed new code would look like what's your feedback on that? Is that the kind of stuff that's yeah. likely to be, I mean, you know, there might be others, but is that the kind of role of that further bit of feedback? Yeah, so the, so the next stage will be a lot more kind of detail oriented. I mean, the reason we've been able to put together uh, a structure of this consultation where you can just look at a little bit of it and say, I like that approach or I don't like that approach or talk about individual themes is because this is uh, a sort of, holistic view of what a new code can look like, whereas the, the later stage will be much more detail focused and it will come down to, um, well, what counts as excessive or what counts as reasonable or what counts as unduly pressurized uh, and establishing whether do we need the rule to say that, do we need something else to say that, it's gonna be much more about looking at the code itself. Um, to do that with the code as it is would have been uh, probably unrealistic, but hopefully the the newer code, which will potentially be significantly shorter, uh, there'll be room to comment on that in detail. Uh, or it might be a, a smaller pool of uh, organizations or representatives who are able, uh, you know, have willing and able to comment on that stuff. And we might focus, we might look to a specific pool of fundraisers to review the rules on events or to review the rules on legacies. Um, so it may not be as, as uh, overarching a process. It'll be a lot more focused on the individual details of what the, the words of the rules say and yeah. what the implications might be. Thank you. 
Um, and uh, there's a question, um, or two questions, I think I saw um, relating to Scotland, um, but um, you know, we're obviously there is a the Scottish uh, panel. Um, so I guess there was a general question, which was just had uh, wanting to know how they had been engaged with this process and whether they kind of been able to to be involved or see what you're proposing so far, and also in relation to you mentioned about the great a likely grace period that would come into place as this was becoming effective. Is there a um, agreed approach in Scotland, for example, that they would, uh, you know, the same grace period in terms of regulating versus, you know, under the new code would be in place aligning to what the fundraising regulator would have? Uh, so on the general Scotland topic, the launch event that we conducted last Wednesday was co-hosted by the, uh, the board in Scotland. Um, They've been very much involved. They are uh, observers and participants at our uh, uh, committees that we have, particularly our standards committee, which has been uh, intimately involved in developing these proposals with us. Um, we are going to be doing, uh, we have a continuing relationship with the, the Scottish panel and we are gonna keep them involved in a lot of the decision-making. The topic of uh, the sort of grace period hasn't been discussed, so I can't say this will definitely happen, but it is a sort of, it's a logical good regulatory practice to not drop a lot of new rules on someone and say, caught you the very next day. Um, the Certainly for the uh, England, Wales and Northern Ireland, um, the edge cases of some Scotland charities that are covered by our uh, investigations, we would still potentially investigate breaches of the old code in that six month period if we think it's there's merit in investigating it and there's there's you know potential harm or potential benefit from uh, from establishing a position on that. So we won't be not doing any regulation. We just won't be regulating the new rules. And I would assume that that is what the Scottish panel will uh, the approach they'll take. But I can't speak for them because this isn't uh, we haven't talked about it in detail yet. So thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to try and wrap together a couple of questions or comments around the um, principles-based um, approach. Um, I hope it makes sense. Um, I think that the, the thing that I'm picking up uh, from people is that there seems to be agreement with it as an approach, um, but questions around um, how it might work in practice and mm -hmm. how it would work alongside the other functions of the fundraising regulator. So I guess kind of, um, you know, so when you talked about, you know, uh, an example being around acting professionally, you know, and, you know, taking off those four or five ones about undue, um, undue pressure and being polite and wrapping it up into one. Um, so that does mean that some organisations may take slightly different views about what professional behaviour is and therefore when they are providing guidance or um, working with their fundraisers about how they expect the fundraising activity to be taken out you might get people kind of putting the benchmark at different places so a, how much of that is a problem from a regulatory aspect um, and then and how do you expect charities to be able to benchmark to ensure that they are doing the right thing if they're not sure? Because, uh, you know, we're saying, well, we're, we're being told we have to make the judgment about what's professional. And that, sorry, I told you it's going to be tricky to wrap up a few in one. So that was one bit. Charities being able to benchmark themselves, make sure they're doing the right thing and not get caught out. And I guess the other part of that is this, you know, you're, we're talking here about setting the code of practice, but there's other things which come off that so for example your regulatory approach how you write how you um make adjudications and put out uh your decision making so would there be a change or a kind of transparency in that regulatory approach moving to a principles based one um because the code will have shifted because you'll have to you'll have to be using your judgment in a way which is maybe different for now because you've been working off a specific, a more detailed code. So two questions, how do charities make sure they're doing the right thing when they're having to interpret it themselves? 
and how might the fundraising regulator change its regulatory approach to work against a, co a principles-based code? Mm -hmm. um, well, I suppose it's a, one thing is that the, the principle-based approach is not going to fix everything immediately. It's, there's, a, there's a give and take involved. And by having a more flexible code that can be applied to a wider range of uh, contexts, there may also need to be uh, a balance of either an expectation of uh, judgments but from charities or uh, requirements for the regulator ourselves to set precedents or to outline specifically what is and is not acceptable in some other context. Uh, that's that's why we're consulting on the idea of, of what you know. Do you think that having a future-proof code is is balanced out by these these other considerations? Um, there, it is a limitation of, of the current code. Uh, a lot of the uh, work that we do as a voluntary, as in self-regulatory context, requires sort of consent and uh, uh, willingness to engage with our expectations. Um, and where there are existing rules that say, um, you know, you, you shouldn't, this, this is, Example I'm picking on is not a, it's not a, a detailed one, but you know, you can't put a bag, you can't put a charity bag through someone's door if there's a sign saying no charity bag, no charity bags. But if they have no junk meal, that's not specifically listed by the no charity bags. You know, there's kind of a, mm -hmm. um, an ambiguity there. So setting an expectation that um, organisations would be expected to think about the principle behind it, which is you shouldn't send fundraising communications or charity bags to people who have indicated that they do not want them uh, or if there's a, an indication there um, then that can lead to hopefully the charity setting up their processes and their, their third party partners to set up their processes that would align with that principle and then there would potentially need to be a <clears throat> an, an investigation to establish where the line is what is uh, reasonable and what's not um, I think that one of the examples I said it earlier was about information about fees and things like that in uh, fundraising communications. Um, the specific way in which something is made clear in a, in a mailing or in a print ad or in an online ad is different, but the principle is that it should be made clear. Um, and that might need to be tested. It might need to be tested through a precedent ruling that says actually having a very small thing that says see website for details that just leads you to the front page of the website and doesn't take you straight to the terms and conditions for a prize draw is not clear. Whereas having click here for terms and conditions and it takes you straight to the terms and conditions is is considered clear. So um, yeah, that's a, there's a balance to be struck and any, any change to the way the code is constructed is going to be a change to the way that we uh, conduct some of our other uh, activities. Um, so I suppose your other point about it, does that have a knock-on effect? Yeah, potentially. We need to understand what the new code will look like and then think about the implications of how we can uh, implement and enforce and uphold that new code. Um, if the responses, which hopefully the poll responses that we've got today will be broadly reflective of the responses we get in the actual consultation, but if everybody responded to the consultation and said, no, no principles based rules, can't stand them, here's why we don't think they're a good idea and here's what we want instead, then we'll come up with a new approach uh, to address that and come up with the uh, changes to our internal processes as a result. So we have ideas in mind to support the proposals that we've made, which is why we're presenting them as proposals rather than sort of let us come up with your own ideas and, and we'll, we'll consolidate them all. But uh, until we have looked at what the consultation responses say, we won't be able to uh, construct new uh, processes and approaches, which again is why now is the time to let us know. Don't, don't wait until there's a new code that's been written. It's full <laughs> of principles. Uh, if you don't think it's good, let us know. Or if you think actually this would be great because I can see where yeah. uh, what we do can be uh, much easier to understand if it's if you just always think, well, is that clear? Does it take them direct to the terms and conditions? 
Um, no, I think it is. No, I'm not sure it's quite right. I can go back and look at that again. Uh, so yeah, now, now is the time to let us know because it will steer uh, the direction of some of the other processes within uh, the organization because the code is what underpins all the work that we're doing really. So yeah, this is this is a good chance for you all. Thank you. And, and I mean, you know, aside from a regulatory aspect, there's always been, um, I think, a role for individual charities when they are looking at how they comply, not just because of compliance is good, but because it's good fundraising and right for donors. So, um, you know, if it is a move, if it is a move to a principles based bit and there is more of a achieve this outcome um, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's a bit more onus on charities to kind of uh, not just decide what they do but to know why they're deciding what they do and to be able to you know if you had questions about you know from a regulator we've had a complaint about this can you show us how you have tried to act as a responsible charity and meet that objective that charity being able to say well these you know this is the kind of evidence that we looked at this is the feedback that we've had from supporters this is how we've trained our fundraisers so that you can explain your rationale and why you've taken certain approaches goes a really long way rather than it being oh we, we don't think you've met that principle um because it yeah. shows you're a responsible charity and caring about what you're doing so i think there's also something which is charities thinking about how they might work in maybe a slightly different way perhaps if you are working more towards a principles based thing um than just the code changing so yeah and potentially some of the revised rules could be framed in the context of you know you must demonstrate that you have given due consideration of X. And so yeah. we can see, has somebody, is somebody able to demonstrate that they give due consideration of that issue? We might be able to say, have they met the legal threshold uh, where they, they could have broken this law or that? But we could say, can they demonstrate they've given due consideration and we can assess that. And any, any set of regulations where there are changes made, then need to be tested. And so there will be periods of testing and, and uh, there's some wider discussions to have about uh, how we as a regulator uh, engage with people who have uh, who have received complaints about the charities who received complaints about and then how we present that information and that that's going to be part of the, the discussion about how we test these good rules. Great thank you um, we could probably keep going down this principles based approach uh, for the rest of the webinar but um, uh, and I think it's one of the really interesting kind of um, ones to, to think through, but I will move on to some of the other um, questions. Um, so there was one around um, the um, lead regulator uh, approach, um, and I'm trying to pick the questions which kind of cover a number of areas um, so that we get um, good value from, from you kind of while you're here. Um, so there was a point raised um, which was kind of taking the Taking the approach that that is probably um, the right thing for the code in terms of minimise the duplication of information and point people to that. But a note that often other regulators, you know, Gambling Commission, um, ICO, HMRC, Charity Commission, and so on, um, you know, their rules might not be as easy to find, easily written, plain English in the same way that your, yours are, or that, you know, you've got four different regulators, so you've got four different styles of writing and expectations, and therefore kind of asking, does that make it more difficult for, for fundraisers because you're kind of being told where to go, but not told the information? Um, and is there a potentially a role if the code was to change that way, either for, for the fundraising regulator or perhaps for us working with you, to not replicate the stuff in the code, but have accessible and easy to read guidance, perhaps, which talks people through that um, that approach. So just, yeah, wondered around your thoughts about the ease through which fundraisers would be able to find and easily follow other regulatory rules if they were not taken, if they were taken out of the code. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one, I think, to, uh, the the approach that we have at the minute where we are trying to take some complex legislation and put it in a digestible format to fit in with the rest of our code is admirable but has flaws um, and so potentially that sort of information could be provided in a different 
context through through guidance on the website, what have you. Um, doing that is quite an undertaking, and so we wouldn't want to just sort of speculatively say, "Oh yeah, we'll 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 get people to spend hours and hours and hours writing this, re reading this legislation, rewriting it, uh, getting it checked for uh, legal standards." Uh, if we're not sure that there's going to be a use to it, um, but I think there's a we have to be realistic about how how much we can uh, provide in that uh, in the in our own code in that respect. Um, we're we're not currently exhaustive in what we do. There are some areas where we've chosen to provide some expansions, and perhaps there will be some areas where we continue to provide expansions in a different context. But we don't cover every single aspect of every law. Mm. That we we uh, that is relevant. We don't cover the fine detail of uh, safeguarding expectations and things like that that do come up with uh, volunteer fundraising. Um, and so uh, there's there's a question of, of how useful it would be for us to aim to do that. And doing it in the code, I think, is is unlikely to be the best way to do it. If we if we were to provide it in guidance, then we can update that relatively. Uh, flexibly, or if we find that there's another body that has some really good guidance, we can have some, here's some links to some useful advice on this, that, and the other, we might be able to find that we don't have to actually conduct all that work ourselves. But by having a, by trying to, to sort of fit and force pieces of legislation into the format of our rules, and then having to consult on changing those whenever those rules change a lot, we end up with a sort of uh, a, a curate's egg. We end up with something that uh, only only serves purpose in part and gets worse as it uh, continues. Um, so yeah, if there's there's room for people to comment on those headline proposals, and if one of them is, I really need to get this information uh, in a format that works for me. Is that something that the regular the funders and regulator can provide? Then that's something that we can. I'd see what's realistic for us to cover, but um, certainly reproducing legislation that's subject to changes at a different pace to the ways that we review our code uh, is sort of setting us up for difficulties. And um, there's the risk that we're, we're putting something out that a month, just a couple of months later is no longer relevant. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got about, what we've got left about just over five minutes. So I reckon I can squeeze in two more questions um, from people. Um, you picked up alongside the kind of big change around principles and lead regulator that there were some areas which you were looking at um, potentially bringing in to the code. So uh, there, I think there were four or five bullet points of areas um, uh, where potentially there are gaps in the code which need to be filled. Um, and somebody had said, are there any plans to review crowdfunding um, mm -hmm. as a specific bit? So um, I guess, is your response, if people think it is important, put it in the consultation response and you will then make plans based on what people say? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, it's good that you're here, Dan, so you can correct me if you've been involved in this a lot longer than I have, okay. but um, large swathes of crowdfunding are not subject to the rules that we have the remit to, to address. So um, it might be that some of the rules in the code about uh, when people fundraise in aid of or on behalf of your organization uh, could be clarified to explain that in the context of crowdfunding, this is what you, the charity, should do. Um, or it may be uh, you know, agreements and relationships with the platforms on which that's conducted, but the, the actual crowdfunding activity uh, isn't currently in the remit of our code. And we're not, I mean, in theory, you can suggest anything, yeah. but if you're suggesting something that would mean a significant expansion of our regulatory remit, then that might not be, this might not be the best forum for you to suggest it. Um, yeah. Not saying that you can't and that we won't, we don't uh, take on this intelligence uh, in a lot of different ways. We have a recently appointed a, a head of proactive uh, regulatory regulation and compliance or something along those lines. Anyway, someone who will look at using data that we have uh, more effectively for regulation and the information that you give us will feed into uh, lots of other pools of information on how we consider what uh, 
future steps will be for the regulator. Uh, but yeah, so if, if there are points, ev ev again, ev as well as every page having the option to uh, upload documents, I believe every page, certainly in section D of the, uh, with the individual sections, allows you to say, is there anything else? Yeah. You know, general thoughts? What are your general thoughts on legacies? What are your general thoughts on grants, fundraising? You know, there's, there's room uh, for those sorts of uh, proposals. But I'd say on the, on the point of crowdfunding, what we would be most likely to be able to do is to uh, contextualize existing rules around crowdfunding rather than create a new set of rules that relate to fundraising, crowdfunding. So people, if it's an issue that people are finding as a challenge or would like the fundraising regulator to address, you can put it in the consultation. That way you will hear it, you know, kind of in the mm -hmm. table, will hear it and it will be read and thought through. But the appropriate response to it might not actually be within the code consultation yeah. because you can't just, you know, suddenly put in a code requirement which expands, you know, massively your uh, regulatory remit and suddenly brings in a whole range of organisations. That would need to be a different process in there. So if it's an issue, if it's affecting you, I'd suggest you put it in, but be mindful that it might not be able to be addressed as part of this bit but will be looked at for, by the fundraising regulator in, in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, Connor, were you about to come in? I'm sorry, I was just, I was just saying, uh -huh. <laughs> yes, I agree. Yeah, cool. Okay, um, so we are coming, um, uh, last couple of minutes. Um, is there anything, Connor, um, that you'd like to um, leave people with in terms of tips on responding or kind of, you know, if you would, uh, you know, could hear one thing from people. Is there a particular question or area, or is it really up to people to decide kind of how to engage with this in a way that works for them? Um, I would encourage people to just have have a look through it first. Uh, it is obviously a, a long set of documents, but there are parts of it that you can breeze through very quickly and have a look at what's going on. So, uh, if you want to look at the early sections and see what's most relevant to you, um, we are very open to uh, suggestions that the whole point of us trying to reach as wide an audience as possible, why we're conducting these webinars, why we're actively reaching out to other, uh, to regional areas and to, and to smaller organizations is because we've, we've had insights that have led us towards these proposals, but we know we haven't heard everything. And so uh, there's, this is the best way you can, if you only have one thing to say, you can say it, Put your email address in and hit submit and it'll get included in the consideration so um really just uh take time to have a, a quick look through it but you may find that you can actually uh submit a response very quickly and conveniently thank you um and um charts institute will be responding um as well and we share in draft kind of um thoughts with members for feedback as well um uh, last question connor when does it? When's the consultation end? Remind us. First of December, so first Friday. December. So it's not exactly twelve weeks. It's twelve weeks and two days, so it ends Friday the first of December. Okay, so there is some time, but um, I looked through it last week. There's a lot of information there, and it is worth looking. It is worth kind of blocking out a bit of time to kind of read it through and then work out what the right bits are for you to for you to respond. And if you do have further questions, so, so I know um, uh, the teams. Email at fundraising regulator is there as part of the consultation document so you can get in touch and they'll be they'll be able to respond to any further questions or any other questions that we haven't been able to get through today. Um, so just in the last minute, uh, just for me to say thank you, Connor, for your time, for your preparation in putting this together. Um, you know, uh, it's brilliant that um, I think we had almost 400 people register for this. There's a, obviously a big interest in in the work that you're doing. And I know people will be wanting to, to take time to look at it and to help you um, in the next steps that you're doing um, to take the code forward. Uh, good luck for the um, traveling roadshow of events um, that you were talking through and I hope you get some good feedback there. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Charles Institute will be working with fundraising regulator through the steps of the consultation as it goes through into the next round of feedback. And then also once the changes alive in terms of helping people navigate and understand or the right training materials that are needed um, to get people up to speed with wherever the code gets to and what it looks like um, at some point towards the end of, was it end of 2024? 
Uh, well, the, the, the launch would probably be early 2025. Okay, we'll look out for it then. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, uh, enjoy the rest um, of your Tuesday. Thanks a lot, Connor. Um, and take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.